ordinary de uh, developer, like I guess most of you, mostly working on integration projects. So what I'll be showing today is more like a hobby or an interest. Um, I'm also part of the uh, Norwegian uh, Java community. Uh, so the Java Zone, I'm involved in the Java Zone program committee. And our call for papers uh, just opened. So if you have something you'd like to share, I would encourage you to, to send a submission. Uh, yeah, so as you see from the title slide, the focus today will be bugs and debugging. Um, I think as, as developers, it's always good to have a little bit of a knowledge about what goes inside uh, such a vital tool. So I hope I will uh, convey some of that today. Um, and first, I would like just to take an overview of the Java Virtual Machine and the various tools we have. Uh, then most of the time, we will look a little bit about the underlying um, frameworks that the debuggers use to extract information from the VM. Then we also look a little bit about how the debugger and the Java Virtual Machine interacts. Um, and lastly, of course, I want to have some experiments of my own, so we will see how we can uh, figure out uh, the cause of a null pointer exception. We will uh, capture stack traces with values and also monitor uh, object instances in, in a JVM. So if we have a uh, Java virtual machine with an application, um, you then, as a sort of a puzzle piece, we have various sort of tools we can connect to it to find information. You have the sort of JMX-based uh, tools. And of course, most importantly, you have your IDE with a debugger that you can connect to the Java process. I will show a little bit. I will mostly use Eclipse and IntelliJ, but also NetBeans has some strong points when it comes to debugging. So I will show uh, different tools. Um, so if we look at this uh, Java process, you have some threads. So say, for instance, you're application is running in thread Y at this point in time. You have stack frames for each uh, method invocation. Uh, from the th um, stack, you have references to objects on the heap. And uh, of course, also, there will be the VM will be knowing what code it's running at this point in time. So just a short comparison of what information the debugger is able to extract compared to other tools. Uh, threads have been with Java from the very beginning. We have very good support for threads in Java, knowing what goes on inside the, the VM. So if you just sort of compare what information is available to management tools, uh, to the process itself, the running guy, and the debugger, we can know what threads there are and frames. We can also uh, suspend threads, resume them, and so on. Uh, we can quite intuitively get information about concurrency and monitors, uh, and we can expect, inspect all the frames on the stack, not just the top one. And we can even modify the state and alter the flow of the program. Uh, if we look at the memory part, uh, we can get information about classes and instances in the VM. We can, of course, follow references from objects, but we can also look at references to objects. Uh, we can modify values in memory. Uh, when it comes to code, we have similar reflective capabilities as in Java to figure out classes, methods, fields, and so on. We're also able to execute code inside the VM. Uh, we can even extract the actual bytecodes that the VM is running. And we can uh, even know exactly what bytecode is being executed at this point in time, which we'll play with later. And we are able to redefine the application by supplying uh, new definitions. Uh, overall, uh, debugging in Java is uh, implemented by something called the Java Platform Debug Architecture, which is based, uh, based on several parts. We have the back end, which is, uh, uses what's called the JVM tool interface. This is a native interface that you can hook into a JVM. Um, and typically then by a command line parameter to inject an agent. And this runs then inside the JVM itself. Um, if you want to do some really 
heavy magic stuff. This is where I do it. I will not cover this today. And then we have the transport layer, which is the Java debug wire protocol, which is the binary protocol that's defined so that you can talk to the back end. So this then decouples the back end from the front end. So if you wanted, for instance, in another programming language, you could create your own front end for a debugger, as long as you're able to, to speak this protocol. And uh, you have different modes, which I guess most of you have experience with. For instance, when your IDE uh, launches a Java process, the IDE will typically be listening at the port, and then the JVM will connect back. But you can also start a uh, Java process independently to make it listen at a certain port, so you can connect the debugger at a later time. Um, and here you also see that the protocol is then uh, implemented by an agent lib, which is injected, as I showed, with, with the back end. Um, but there is a readily available front end in the tools.jar of your JDK, which is called the Java Debug Interface. Uh, and here you then uh, find the interfaces to talk to the VM. And as you see on the left-hand side here, I put up some of the main entities, which should probably make a lot of sense from your own mental model of a, of a virtual machine. You have similar concepts to, to reflection and, and threads and so on. And on the right-hand side is more with uh, things that are specific for, for debugging. So the starting point when you launch a debugger is you get a reference to a virtual machine, which is a sort of master object of, of this connection. Um, it has the capability to ask the VM what sort of debugging it supports, because debuggers have evolved over time. So you, you want, for instance, uh, if you have Java 1.6 or newer, you're able to access the memory and so on. So it's, it's a gradual improvement. We can also uh, pro uh, manage the process, suspend the entire VM, resume it, uh, even terminate it, or if you are connecting, connect and disconnect. Uh, this is also the place where you do hot code replacement. So you uh, specify a map of types you want to replace and new bytecodes for those types. And new invocations of methods will learn the new version. If you have any existing stack frames on the old versions, it also will be marked as obsolete, and you typically get a warning in, in your IDE. Um, if you look at the code point of view, um, from the VM, we can get hold of the types that are loaded. Uh, so we have one object per type uh, that you can access by name or all the types, or from an object, as we will see later. And here we have access to all instances of that type. And we have access to bytecodes, which I will show, show later. We can also, at this point, uh, see or um, change any static fields of the class. Um, yeah, so if you have a reference to a type, we can then get all instances. So uh, if I, for instance, um, Debug something in Eclipse. If we have any type, you can then ask for, for all the instances of it. Uh, you can also get the instance count uh, specifically. And you can have, uh, even have that in a separate column. I will do some demos later where I monitor a VM uh, continuously for, for types of objects. Um, yeah. Uh, and something I will show near the end, there's also uh, the types are also aware of any subtypes that are loaded in the VM. Not on the class, but with what are actually loaded. So I'll also show later how we can use this for something useful to find out what your application actually has loaded. Um, and then we have methods, which then contain similar information as in Java Reflection, but they also contain information about mapping from code to source. Um, so if we have a very trivial Java method here uh, that adds two numbers, you have the source code on the left, and on the right-hand side we see the resulting bytecodes. Uh, when we compile this Java file, 
we can then choose to add line information to the class file. And this will be then uh, recorded in a structure like this, which tells us that uh, when you begin at bytecode index 0, we're at line 34 of the source file. And when we reach um, bytecode index 4, we have reached uh, line 35 of the source file. Uh, this, uh, you don't, we don't need to deal with this structure. We get this readily mapped back when we talk to the, to the APIs. Similarly, we get source information about the variables. So uh, the first three entries here, you see, is the receiver object. We name this and uh, two parameters, A and B. And the code that's loaded at bytecode index 4 is then uh, an integer with name C. Um, so, so this has been the way all along in Java. And uh, personally, I think being based on line numbers is, is not too bad, but it could have been uh, better. We could have higher re resolution. So just show uh, quickly what sort of things the various tools do to, um, to overcome this limitation. Like for instance, here I'm, I'm, I'm debugging an Eclipse. We see we have an extremely long line. And so uh, the traditional step over, you would run everything. A step in, step out is very tedious. So, um, so for instance, in, in Eclipse, you would do, you can highlight the piece of code, and you can say step into selection which will take you straight there. Uh, you can also, um, if you press Alt and Command or Control pressed, you can also control the stepping like this. So this is sort of a neat thing they've done to, to give you better control over where you want to go. We see even if we format over several lines, it's still a bit confusing because you have one or more expressions here and there, it's jumping up and down. Was this the first time or the last time and so on? Uh, NetBeans has done even more. Uh, so we, if we run the same piece of code here, uh, we see that uh, yeah. We see that uh, they have this option called struggling a bit. It was a lot lower resolution than I usually do. But we have something called step over expression, which will highlight the next expression that's going to be executed. So you see the next will be this one. And if I do the same again, you see that the if you're able to see it, there's a bit a darker shade of green that uh, highlights the next expression going to be executed. We also see that uh, in the variables view here, we can see the, uh, the history of return values. And I can even uh, place the cursor over a previously executed uh, expression and be able to view that. So, so this is an example where they've done quite a lot to, to overcome the limitations uh, then we have, of course, with, with Java 8, inclusion of, inclusion of lambdas, some more challenges for the debuggers. Um, when you compile this, we will compile the test method, which will then have a line number table. Uh, in the place of the lambda, you will get an invoke dynamic instruction, uh, and the actual lambda body will become a separate um, method that would also contain the line number table. So if I use an ordinary line breakpoint here, I will still be able to, to, to use it for both cases. So uh, for instance, if, if I run an Eclipse, um, let's see the first time. OK, that's one line before. The first time I hit the breakpoint, I'm in the test method. Uh, if I resume it, you will see from the stack that this time I'm in the lambda and so on. You can also use step into selection with various degrees of success. Uh, this is a point where uh, the version 15 of IntelliJ, IntelliJ has added some, some nice features. So um, if I 
uh, want to debug a lambda. If I attempt to place a breakpoint at the line with lambdas, I will be presented with some options to uh, play also make the breakpoint specific to the body of a given lambda. Uh, also here, if I uh, proceed, um, this corresponds to step into selection in Eclipse is what's called smart step into in, in IntelliJ. Uh, so if I, I do that here, again, I'm presented with options. So if, for instance, if I want to step directly into this lambda, I can just choose this, and I will be taken, taken straight there. So th the, the information is there in the APIs, and the various vendors are then adopting this at, at uh, different uh, rates. I, I guess you will have good solutions on all platforms uh, at some point. Uh, just as we were looking at this uh, debug info in the class file, um, what if you don't include debug information with the code you ship? What do you achieve? Well, uh, the file sizes will be slightly smaller because there's less information you need to, to embed. Uh, but more importantly, what do you lose? So. OK, one, you lose the argument names, which is annoying if you've been debugging some, some libraries where, where this is the case. Um, more seriously, you lose information about temporary variables. And even worse, you will have stack traces like this. So uh, personally, I don't see why you would ever compile without debugging uh, info unless you want to make your life miserable or, or somebody else's. So um, I, I don't see any good argument for that. Um, yeah, so that was the code structure, fields, values, method. If we look at uh, what we can do with objects, one cool thing about debugging is you have probably noticed that each object has a unique ID, which is assigned by, by the debugger. Um, or the, the interface in the JVM. So you're able to identify objects over time. And also, if you look at the traffic going over the wire, this ID is used as the identification of objects. Uh, one cool thing that's both in uh, IntelliJ and uh, NetBeans is the ability to, to mark an object. So we have this integer, 959. I could uh, create a custom um, a label for it. So for instance, I'm working a lot with Apache Camel, where I have to follow this uh, messaging object through a flow. So it's often good to have your own logic um, tags on them, so you know if it's the same object or another object of the same class. Um, yeah, so when you have an object, we can get values, and we can set values. Uh, one thing that's probably fairly obvious, but it's still worth to point out, is that for the debugger, there's no such thing as private, right? So uh, if you want to look into some enterprise stack or a library, if you place a breakpoint, you'll always be able to see what the implementation is and look at its state which I find very useful. Um, also, if you evaluate code in IntelliJ, you can also traverse uh, private fields as uh, method calls. So, so the debugger is a really powerful tool to get inside stuff that's otherwise hidden for you. Uh, yeah, and uh, on the object, we can invoke methods, which we'll see the use of later. And we have uh, referring objects. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I terminated that one. Just take any any sort of object we have. So you can also see all the references to the object. Uh, one uh, nice thing in Eclipse is you can also say that you want to display references as variables. So, for instance, if I um, expand this, the references will uh, appear here. So in this way, I could also uh, walk the references backwards. For instance, if you're struggling with a uh, memory leak or something, and you want to see who, who holds on to this object, I find this, this quite uh, useful. I'm also working on some IDE plugins to give better visualizations of this. 
Um, yeah. Yes, when it comes to threads, uh, I mean, we get the name and states of all threads um, a bit differently implemented in the various tools. Um, we can suspend threads, find out what's going on, resume them again. Uh, we can, of course, rewind to a certain beginning of a certain frame to figure out what was going on up to that point. And we can, in some ideas, you can also say that if you want to affect the flow of the program, you can say, okay, this method should return true, for instance, to sort of affect the flow of the program. Um, but one thing that I found very interesting is that in this API, the concurrency information about monitors is very easily and intuitively available. So if I have a thread, and it's waiting, I can ask for giving me a reference to uh, the monitor it's, it's uh, waiting for, then I can get a reference to the object, and from there I can know which thread holds on to this. Uh, and the other way around, if so I can see that thread one is waiting for thread zero because it's waiting for the lock on, uh, on this uh, ID 36. This is from uh, Eclipse. Eclipse gives you a very good visualization on this. It will also uh, highlight deadlock threads in, in red. So it's a very good tool to, to find out about this. You could go the other way. You can ask a thread for any uh, uh, monitors it owns and any threads waiting on that monitor. So you have this relation either way, so which is a lot simpler than uh, reading through a thread dump and analyzing that by yourself. Yeah, uh, stack frames, I think we covered this. Then we have what's called the location, and the location is uh, unique for the debugger because this is the, this is the sort of link between the stack, the thread, the state of the application execution, but also it contains then references to the method, the method, the type, and even down to the bytecode index. So we'll see later how we can, can use this for some cool stuff. Um, OK, so now I've shown sort of the virtual machine and the various functionality you can access from there. But most of the time when you're using a debugger, it's an interactive tool. So it's a bit similar to a, a GUI toolkit that you, you request, sort of where you ask for um, events that you're interested in and you get these back. So you have a number of different requests the debugger can send to the VM. Um, probably not most of these, there are, there are more also, it's a bigger picture. Um, so you set up a, a request, for instance, in this case we want a watch point on a temporary variable in a class so that whenever somebody tries to write a value to, to this field, uh, we should get a notification. So we will uh, ask for a modification watch point on a given field. And when we have that request, we can then tailor it to uh, have the various sort of filtering you are um, probably used to from debugging, that you know it should be only on this instance, only in this thread, only in a certain class, and so on. And you decide whether you want the entire VM to suspend just the thread where it occurs to suspend, or and uh, not to suspend at all. And then you can, uh, initially it's disabled, so you can then enable the request, and then at that point the VM will start to send events back whenever this, this occurs. You can also access the, uh, the event, the requests you have already registered. So then you get an event back. Uh, this, uh, so all events, uh, events will refer back to the request. Most events have location information, so this occurred at a, a certain location in a certain thread. And for in, in this case, it was a watch point, so it will also tell us which field in which object, what's the current value of it, and what is it going to set it to. So this is something you could uh, obviously uh, use programmatically, even though um, the breakpoint management in an IDE might be kind of uniform. But there's lots of information um, for the various types. Um, yeah, so this is sort of uh, the, uh, the interfaces as is, uh, quite 
uh, straightforward, really. Um, you can, can play around with it if you want. It's not many lines of code. But when we come to code evaluation, this is a, a topic where the IDEs have to do a lot more heavy lifting themselves. And this is much more complex. Um, so for instance, if, uh, if we have Eclipse, this is re more widespread than you might think. For instance, we have the display pane where you can uh, evaluate arbitrary code. Uh, See. So, for instance, if I run some code here, I can get it to run. But uh, you can also then highlight code here, make it run. In IntelliJ, you would keep Alt pressed and just click. Uh, you also have, uh, if you have conditional breakpoints, as we will see, there will be um, code evaluation uh, involved. If you have watch expressions, those will get executed. But even just uh, getting this um, to string representation of this object requires the IDE to ask through the, this interface something to be executed in the target VM. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really important, and, and this is a place where uh, they have to do quite a lot of work. So in order to make this work, any code is evaluated in a certain context. So in the VM, you will be in a stack frame, in a thread. You will have a receiver object, possibly. You may have arg arguments, temporary uh, variables, uh, instance variables, this sort of thing. Um, some methods are visible, others are not. Uh, so the uh, IDE has to then sort of replicate these constraints. So when you type this code, it's then compiled and interpreted in that context. Uh, some things like you know arithmetic operations, things like that, could then be interpreted on in the IDE directly. But then, whenever you uh, do something on an object, you will then have to send uh, a command over the wire and wait for the result. So typically, when you evaluate code, there's quite a lot of traffic and overhead going on. Uh, so this. Um, and there are some limitations. The VM has to be at the breakpoint in order for you to, to evaluate code. And for instance, in Eclipse, there's a uh, runtime model on the client side, so you cannot do one evaluation inside another, for instance. So um, one place where you should be aware of this is if you use conditional breakpoints. Because then it will follow this uh, request event cycle. So we will set up a breakpoint of a certain kind. Uh, then you will get an event back, at which point the thread, or uh, maybe an entire VM, depending on, on what you asked for, will then get halted in the target VM. And then your tool will evaluate the code. And if it's false, it will tell it to resume. So from uh, the event was received until you resume it, the thread in, in the target VM is effectively halted. Uh, so this can, uh, can have some, some side effects and, and some impacts on the VM. So uh, for instance, if we are, uh, if we are uh, have uh, really quite meaningless code here, the only point is that we do some iterations and there's a um, conditional breakpoint involved. At th this time, it's, it's disabled. So the whole thing runs in 20 milliseconds. If I should enable it and run again. It takes almost four seconds. Um, so this is a thing to sort of think about when you're using conditional breakpoints, um, especially if you're, uh, for instance, connected to a server and you could um, affect somebody else's work, uh, you then I should at least make the, the breakpoint specific to your thread. Uh, disable it when you're finished with it so you can keep the condition, but it will not kick in. Also, I guess if you're connecting to a server, I find it a good practice to disconnect as soon as possible so that you don't 
uh, risk affecting uh, the state and other people's work. Um, all right, so um, I mean the debuggers do a lot, but I, I just by looking at this information that was available, uh, I thought there's there's a lot more you could do, and and I think the tools could could use this for a lot more. So uh, played around a little bit myself. Um, so if I start a little demo. I noticed that um, yeah. some old screen here. Just see. Maybe, maybe zoom down a little bit. Okay, I see. I'm quite okay on time, so uh, I could probably have time to give a little bit of background. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you have yeah, you have the JMX ba based tools. Uh, this is the Hot IO JBoss project. Anyone familiar with it? It's it's very 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 good tool. I, I rarely ever use JVisual VM or these tools anymore because what uh, this does is you have a, a good HTML5 front end and it has a very small back end which is injected to the VM and just speaks JMX over JSON. So we have then, uh, so you, you do have various information about, uh, and you have then plugins if you're doing uh, active MQ, uh, camel, things like that. You have good visualization and monitoring of tools. So I created a little plugin, and what this does is it injects a little agent, and the agent will connect to the, to the VM process, and it will expose some of this information over uh, via JMX, so I can visualize it here. Um, so, uh, and then we have this crappy application with a lot of problems in it. Um, maybe I should, uh, I, I can show the problem first. So we have some rather hopeless uh, code here which will um, we get null pointers. And when we look at the code, it's not really helpful because here we have a long chain of method calls and we really have no idea where things went wrong. In fact, this will actively uh, randomly simulate null pointers. So it's, uh, it's not a very thankful uh, task. Uh, and so I mentioned earlier that we had some more information from the events we receive, and we have this location thing. So this is what happens. If I create a request for null pointers, I will get an exception event back from the VM. And that event will contain information about the location where this happened which has what's called the code index, so it shows the bytecode index of that method. From the method, I can also, via this uh, debugging interface, ask for giving me your bytecodes. And these are the real bytecodes that are running. Even if the class is instrumented or anything with it, I can get that information out. And then the bytecode will contain, then it should be a method call, so it should be uh, invoke virtual or invoke interface. And uh, in order to figure out the uh, details of the exact meth message, I have to uh, go into something called the constant pool, which is um, the storage in Java class files for, for this sort of information. So if I then succeed to get the bytecode, figure out that. The exception event also has a reference to the exception event, so the actual null pointer exception, which is being thrown in that application. So once I have this information, I would then like to modify the uh, uh, message on the null pointer to include information about which method this was. 
Um, so if I then go back here, I could, um, yeah, I can disconnect it. And if we try the same uh, code again, I get a null pointer exception. Uh, but this time it says, if you're able to read this, it's, it, it will tell you what method it was trying to, to invoke. Uh, and this, for the target application, it has no knowledge of this. The only, only difference is that there will then be more information in the, in the exceptions that occur and, and in the log of that application. So it doesn't uh, really notice this. Um, yeah, I thought if the code for this is really quite straightforward. Um, as I said, I can get the bytecodes from the method. I can figure out where in the bytecodes this is. I will have to parse the constant pool. as a, a bit more technicalities there. Find out what this is. On the exception, I will find the instance variable named detail message of the exception class. Uh, I will have to, uh, this is something special f in order for me to take a local string and make it a string value inside the target VM. And I simply set that into um, the value of, of the detail message on, on that exception. Um, yeah, and also uh, if for troubleshooting, if you had various sorts of uh, problems, I said uh, something called emit walkbacks. This is a bit uh, inspired by my small talk background because here we can also have, so this was 12.05 and this is now, now. We can also then capture the state for for troubleshooting purposes. Uh, an improvement here might be to use a format that would be parsable by the ID or whatever. So you can see that in addition to the normal stack trace, we can see the receiver object, but we can also see argument values or temporary variables if there are any. So if you wanted to sort of analyze this stuff leading up to the to the null pointer. Um, and as we are looking at this, I showed you that you were able to, to get instance uh, counts. Uh, so uh, I also added the possibility that I could, uh, I could uh, set up watches on particular interesting classes. Uh, something like this. Um, and then I use some um, functionality that's already in the stack of this uh, hot IO tool. So if we have some JMX bean with um, attributes that are uh, numeric, you can chart them and you can even uh, add it to dashboard. So for instance, if I then uh, yeah. Allocate some objects, maybe release a few, allocate some more. We should then be able to see over time, we can get a graph of instances over the timeline here. Uh, this is live then, it's polling every second, every two seconds, I think. And you can also control that. Also, I showed you that. Uh, yeah, I'll just close this. That um, we also have information about subtypes. Uh, which so so these are not like this. If you do uh, a browse hierarchy in Eclipse or IntelliJ, it will show you what you have in your setup, but. When you talk to a debugger, it, it actually knows what classes are loaded. So I thought another uh, improvement of this would be, for instance, if I was um, I was wondering what sort of database connections I had. I could uh, then you can then show me, okay, I have these three implementations and it's ten instances of this guy. So I maybe want to watch that. You can also see here that I I can also see 
that there's a proxy involved. This is this this proxy I wouldn't know before runtime, so maybe I could be interested in this. Then I would have the same uh, same information in the in the uh, dashboard here. So that's uh, also I'm, I'm thinking about some IDE plugins to to enable you to figure out this sort of thing in in a VM, like typically database drivers, things like that, uh, to see what you have loaded. Um, yeah. So just to to round up. Uh, the Java debugging interface has some very powerful capabilities. We can uh, see the current state on the stack. Uh, we can uh, easily access information about monitors in the threads in that VM. Uh, we have uh, good capabilities for memory that I also shown that also outside the IDE it's quite easy to to uh, use this to to monitor things. And we have. Uh, access to the actual code. Uh, and uh, debuggers do a lot of clever stuff to, to do things better, for, uh, make your life as a developer better. But I think there's still a lot, lot more they could do, especially when it comes to the code thing. For instance, if you're debugging and obviously the source attachment is not correct, I'm working on some stuff to reverse engineer out of that interface to, to show what you're actually running and so on. So. Um, yeah, uh, some references. Uh, just a normal Java distribution contains information about these APIs. Very uh, in-depth Java doc, for instance, on these objects. What the implement, uh, yeah, the different methods, what you should be aware about, and so on. Uh, you can also, I think, it's a good idea to, if you're working on IDE plugins or things like that, it could be a good idea to actually look into your ID, um, and uh, it's that is a bit more complex, but I still think it's meaningful. The demos I showed are on GitHub, and the slides are on online, uh, so you can access them later. Um, any questions? It depends. Um, I think uh, I was very impressed with NetBeans, but I've not really ever used NetBeans much. So, um, but uh, when you saw this step over selection thing, which uh, I, I have a small talk background, so that was the way I used to debug. So I've been quite annoyed with this. Then, of course, you have the Lambda support in IntelliJ. <laughs> uh, when it comes to sort of being able to evaluate code dynamically, I. Uh, I'm mostly an Eclipse developer myself, so so often uh, <laughs> tough tough choice. I think I think uh, for me personally Eclipse, but that's preference more than anything. So yeah. Any else? Any others? Yes. Like when you're requesting white codes. Yeah. Yes. Um, you, um, you, that's that's true. So, in the IDE, when I showed like um, uh, show instances, these things, the, when you're working in IDE, you typically have an object and you follow the object to the class. If I go from the virtual machine side, I will typically say, okay, I want Java lang string, and then the return value will be an, uh, a list or an array. I don't remember because there could be possibly be the same class be loaded in various class loaders. So I guess when the, uh, when the uh, for example, uh, Eclipse does a host called replace, it has the context to know both the class and the class loader. You also have reference to the class loader from, from the class. Uh, so, uh, so this method where you specify the, the classes and the new bytecode, that requires specifying exactly which type it is. Uh, so if there are more than, than uh, but I, I think the IDs would typically know which one it is. Yes? You seem to drive everything via the debugger, also kind of trying to get the whole state of the JVM. So how do you stand then to tools like JProfile or Mission Control? Do you think they are not even needed when you debug, or do you still see a value in JProfile? Mission Control is my preferred choice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you have to distinguish maybe a little bit between 
development and production because uh, I wouldn't run this on a production environment, uh, but there you have other tools that that are more, uh, you know, industrial strength for this these sort of things. Um, now it's, I mean, I'm not opposed to anything. I, 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 as I, I tried to show an overview. I'm, I'm interested in any source of information about the JVM. And what I showed this other thing was to, to create this agent to hook up to the, uh, the debugger and then uh, enable it through JMX so that you could then sort of combine the two worlds, make more information accessible there, for instance. Yeah. And others? Yes. Yeah. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit clumsy. And it's <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I should. I can go into into. Which, um, can you see on the left hand side there? Fifty something. Well, you can have uh, you can have uh, breakpoints for either class initialization or I think the count is rather quick. Yeah. So so if I if I want to include string, that's not a problem. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So this this is not a problem because all we're doing is we ask for the type and we ask the VM for uh, the count value. Now, if you wanted to. No. This this is based on the count. Uh, two separate methods. One method is count that returns along, which just gives you how many there are. And then you have another method to retrieve all the instances. Is it possible I see the string instance value? You could, you could. Yeah, yeah. So I'm also playing a little bit about the memory, uh, the, the memory analyzer tool. Eclipse to sort of because that is based on heap dumps, yeah. But you, for instance, in the memory analyzer tools, you can write write little scripts that will run through a heap, and I'm looking for objects with a certain characteristics. I think you could, you could it would be possible to create a similar sort of functionality based on what you find in APIs here, because you have access to the objects, you're able to evaluate code. So, so, but uh, I don't know a way to do that now. But uh, I would really like to see something like that. Yeah. Uh, any others? Uh, I think I. Let's just see if we're able to resume it from here. It's this is. Uh, okay. So. Um, Lunch, everyone. Thank you for your time.